Welcome to Module 6, Lecture 2. This is the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle. We're going to show how fluctuations of measurements about the average tell us something interesting about the quantum state. I have for you three pictures of measurements showing what the results are averaged around the exact value and what the fluctuations are for different experimental trials. So if we prepare a system in a single eigenstate, we always get the same answer in the measurement, and that's shown on the left. If, however, the quantum state is in a superposition of different states, then we'll get one value during a measurement and another value and so forth, and we'll see more fluctuations. And the fluctuations can be small, as shown in the middle, or they can be large, as shown on the right. Studying these fluctuations tells us information about the state being measured. And indeed, that's one of the interesting things that one can do with quantum mechanical measurements. So let's now talk about what happens if I want to measure the properties of two different operators. Suppose those operators are incompatible operators. And what incompatible means is these two operators do not commute. If you recall, when we have two operators that do not commute, then they cannot both have measurements that are fluctuation free. And the reason why is we can prepare the system in the eigenstate of one operator. And when we're in an eigenstate, we have no fluctuations because when we measure the value corresponding to that operator, it always gives the same value because there's only one value in the, available in the state given by the eigenstate. But then the other state is not in an eigenstate because the two operators are incompatible. And so there must be fluctuations in the other operator. So just by thinking in terms of whether or not I can have a simultaneous eigenvector, we learn something about whether or not we can find two measurements of different operators that have no fluctuations. And this argument tells us that the answer to that is no. A related question is how small can we make the fluctuations of the measurements of these two different operators if we vary the state that we prepare the system in? Is there any limit to how small we can make it? This question is essentially the issue discussed and ultimately resolved by the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Let's take a look at an example from a classical oscillator. So remember your equation of motion for a classical oscillator. We just get simple harmonic motion. The position as a function of time is just some amplitude a times the cosine of omega t plus some phase shift phi. And if I want to calculate the velocity of that, I would just take the derivative. And if I want the momentum, I would take that derivative and multiply it by the mass. So the momentum as a function of time is just minus omega m a sine omega t plus phi. We now look in terms of averages and fluctuations as averages over time. Now, obviously, if I look at the average value of a cosine, I'm going to get 0. If I look at the average value of a sine, I'm going to get 0, especially if I'm averaging that over a period. But when we look at the fluctuations over the same period, we find that those fluctuations, which we write as delta squared of x, are equal to the time average. So there's a 1 over t integral from 0 to t, t being the, being the period of the motion, a squared cosine squared omega t plus phi dt. Now, you might be a little bit worried about how do I integrate a cosine squared, but as long as the integration range is an integer multiple of a half period, then I can just replace the cosine squared by a half and then uh, think of it as a constant in the integral. So I can immediately do that integral. I'll get 1 half a squared t. When I divide by t, I get a squared over 2. We can do the same thing for the momentum, and we'll get the, a very similar result. It's a squared times omega squared m squared divided by 2. Now let's look at the average energy. The energy is the average of p squared over 2m plus... 1 half m omega squared, the average of x squared. If you look at those fluctuations, the delta squared of x is the average of x squared because the uh, 
average of x was equal to 0. And similarly for the average of p squared. That's the delta squared of p. So I can just substitute in those answers, and I find it's equal to a squared times m omega squared over 2 when I take into account those constants that are out in front. So if I now rewrite those fluctuations in terms of the average energy, I find that delta of x is the square root of e divided by the square root of m times omega, and I find delta of p is the square root of e times m. Now if I multiply those two together, I find the product of the fluctuations of x times the fluctuations in p are equal to e over omega. I would like you to remember that classical result of e over omega because we're going to see it return in the quantum calculations. All right, let's summarize what we've been doing with the classical oscillator. For a classical oscillator, we looked at fluctuations over time and we found that those fluctuations satisfied this uncertainty or um, let's call it an uncertainty relationship uh, that the uncertainty in x multiplied by the uncertainty in momentum was equal to e over omega. As the amplitude is made smaller and smaller, we can make these fluctuations as small as we would like. And as a goes to zero, those fluctuations go to zero. And that's obviously clear. If I, if I have no amplitude of oscillation, the simple harmonic oscillator just sits there doing nothing and it has no momentum and it has no position. And so the average value of that and of the fluctuations are all zero. If the oscillator, however, is oscillating with a large amplitude, then the larger the energy will get a larger energy and larger fluctuations. And you know that as I increase the amplitude of the oscillations, it takes more energy. And the fluctuations are essentially given by how much the amplitude is oscillating back and forth. Now, many of these results actually carry over to the quantum re realm. But the way that we describe them is different. We no longer look at averages over time, as we do in the classical case, but we look now at quantum fluctuations with regards to measurements. The end results are very similar when we compare the fluctuations, but just remember that in the quantum case, we're looking at fluctuations over measurements, which is different than looking at the fluctuations over time, or the average of the fluctuations over time. All right, so let's define what these quantum fluctuations are. We've already done this, and so this is something that you know, so we're going to just review this very quickly. If we prepare the system in a state psi, then the average result of the measurements of an operator A is given by the expectation value of A in the state psi. So it is this matrix element psi A psi. And similarly for B, I'll get a psi B psi for the average value of the measurements for B. The fluctuations are found by subtracting the average and then looking at the square of the operator minus the average. Again, sandwiched between the state that I'm doing the measurement in, which is psi. So we'll call del squared A of psi, that's the square of the fluctuations, is given by psi, the operator A hat minus the average value of A in the state psi, quantity squared, expectation value with psi. And you also saw before, if we expand that out, we do a FOIL of that square and evaluate the terms, we find that it actually simplifies. And it's the expectation value of A squared minus the expectation value of A quantity squared. And that's how we find the fluctuations. Now, when psi is an eigenvector of A with eigenvalue little a, then the expectation value a psi a is equal to little a. Let me carefully go through that derivation. When a operator acts on psi, it gives little a times psi. And when I take the inner product with the psi bra, I can pull the a out of that, and I get little a times psi psi, but psi times psi is 1, and so I'm just left with a. Now, when we calculate the expectation value of a squared, I operate a big A operator on psi, I get little a times psi. If I operate big operator A on psi again, I get another little a times psi. And so the net effect is just going to give me an a squared. And now if we take those two results and plug them into our formula for the fluctuations, you see the fluctuations vanish. So when I'm in an eigenstate, I have no fluctuations. What happens when I'm not in an eigenstate? 
That's what we're going to talk about next. So there's actually a geometrical interpretation to what these fluctuations are. And I want to go through that argument first. Since we're measuring A, it must be a Hermitian operator because the operators that we're going to measure are A, they have real eigenvalues, and the results of my measurements are going to be real numbers. Now, I do want to caution you that this does not mean that I can never measure something that is a complex quantity. Indeed, I can measure things that are complex quantities. I just can't measure them with one measurement. I have to separately measure the real part and the imaginary part, and I have to construct a way of measuring them in such a way that I can actually measure those two separate parts. But for this case, we're going to consider operators that are Hermitian, and that those are the operators we're looking at the measurements for. And then I can rewrite A as A dagger, and I'm going to do that. I'm going to rewrite both terms of the squaring. So I'm going to have an A dagger minus average of A and an A minus average of A. And I wrote it as an A dagger on the left-hand side because now you can see, I can think of that as the norm of the vector A operator minus average of A acting on psi. Because to find the norm of that, I would take the dagger of that entire expression and multiply it by the original vector. That means that the fluctuations on psi are equal to this difference. Now let's think carefully about this. The expectation value or the average value of the operator A in state psi is telling me how much of the vector A acting on psi is in psi. When I multiply by a bra, it's the same as asking the question, how much of psi is in that vector? And so I am taking the vector acting on psi and I'm subtracting the amount of a psi that lies along the original direction of psi. What am I going to be left with? I'm going to be left with something that's perpendicular to psi. And this picture shows you exactly how that works. You see, I have psi, that's this small piece at the bottom. When I operate a psi on it, I get this large vector. Remember, when an operator acts on a vector, all it can do is multiply it by some number. It can scale it, and it can rotate it. So here it has scaled and rotated it. I now look at the projection of a psi back on psi. That's this second vector here. If I take a psi and subtract the projection of a on psi, you see I'm left with that perpendicular piece. And so the fluctuations, the geometry relevant for fluctuations in quantum mechanics correspond to the fact that the fluctuations are measuring what the perpendicular component of A psi is when I'm thinking about perpendicular relative to the original vector psi. Okay. The figure probably conveys that better than the words that I just said did, but I think you should be able to clearly understand what those words mean. So the fluctuation can be thought of as the norm of the component of A psi that is perpendicular to psi. And of course, when that perpendicular component vanishes, that means A psi is in the same direction as psi, and that, of course, means I have an eigenvector. That's actually the definition of an eigenvector. So it's interesting to have this geometrical picture in mind when you're thinking about fluctuations. All right, we're going to now look at a quantum way of calculating things for the simple harmonic oscillator. And to do that, that means we're going to have to be working with commutators and things like that. And the way that we do it is using something called the Virial theorem. You've probably never heard of the Virial theorem. The way the Virial theorem works is we work with an operator that is the product of the position times the momentum. And that weird combination is called the virial. Don't ask me where the name comes from. I don't know. It's certainly a weird name. So let's look at the commutator of the kinetic energy with the virial. I just am going to use the Leibniz rule. I pull an x out to the left and a p out to the right. When I pull an x out to the left, I have the commutator of p squared with p, but that's 0. So I don't have to worry about that. But then I'm left with the commutator of p squared over 2m with x. I can evaluate that with the Leibniz rule, and you find that you get minus i h bar times p squared over m. I get a p squared because the commutator is minus i h bar p over m, but then I'm multiplying by a p that is on the right, and I'm left with p squared over m. And so you can see the commutator of the virial 
with the kinetic energy gives minus i h bar times the minus two i h bar times the kinetic energy operator. It's almost like an eigen vector equation for operators, if you like. I'm getting a number times the thing that the operator that I started with. Okay, don't take that analogy too far because we don't really think about eigenvector, eigenvalue relationships when it comes to commutators and operators. But let's do the same thing now for the potential energy. Uh, again, when I do the Leibniz rule, I can pull an x out to the left, I'm left with a p, and I can pull a p out to the right, I'm left with the x. Of course, commutator of x squared with x is equal to zero. And so it's only that first term that I have to worry about to calculate the commutator of x squared with p. I'm going to use the Leibniz rule again. I'm going to get, in this case, 2ih bar m omega squared times x. But I have an extra x on the left, so that becomes an x squared. And again, you can see this is 2ih bar times the kinetic energy, remember, uh, times the potential energy. The kinetic energy was minus 2ih bar, and the, and the potential energy is plus 2ih bar. All right, so now let's actually just calculate the commutator directly when it is evaluated between two of the same eigenstates. So psi n is an eigenstate with energy En. We're going to evaluate it by writing out the commutator and then noticing that I can operate H on the eigenstate. In the first term, I operate it to the left. On the second term, I operate it to the right. In both cases, they're eigenstates, so they pull out ENs. But there's a minus sign there. So I'm going to get an EN minus EN. So it turns out that this expectation value of the commutator of H with the virial is equal to zero. Well, that has an impl implication now when I look at the expectation value of the kinetic energy and of the potential energy. You can see that because that's equal to zero, if I cancel out the IH bars and I divide both sides by two, you can see the kinetic energy the average value of the kinetic energy is equal to the average value of the potential energy. And that's a special thing that happens with a simple harmonic oscillator. And we actually call that the virial theorem. So I have the average kinetic energy is equal to the average potential energy. That means the total energy is equal to the sum of those two, or turned in an opposite way around. The average kinetic energy and the average potential energy are each equal to one half the total energy. That means that the fluctuations of p in the state psi n are equal to the square root of m times e. And the fluctuations of x in the state psi n are the square root of e divided by the square root of m times omega. So that again just follows from the fact that the kinetic energy and the potential energy are both equal to one half e, and then I just solve for the expectation value of p squared and the expectation value of x squared. Again, for the simple harmonic oscillator, the average value of p and the average value of x are equal to zero. We haven't explicitly verified that for you yet in the class, but we will do that soon. And at this point, you can just trust me that that's true. Now, notice what happens when I take the product of those two, the fluctuations of the momentum and the fluctuations of position in the state psi. When I multiply the two of those together, I get E over omega. I hope you remember what I asked you to remember back when we were doing the classical calculation using averages over time. There we found that the average was E over omega again. And so this average is actually the same for the product of the fluctuations in position and fluctuations in momentum. Well, let's go through a mathematical interlude to get us into proving the general result for the uncertainty principle for an arbitrary Hamiltonian. That requires us to work with the Schwartz inequality. The Schwartz inequality is essentially the inequality that you already know about vectors, which says the dot product between two vectors is less than the product of the norms of each of the vectors. And we use that actually to, to verify or establish that the dot product between two vectors is the length of A times the length of B times the cosine of the angle between the two vectors. So we're going to do the proof, however, using the quantum dirac Braquette methodology and notation. So we're going to look initially here at the norm squared of a vector that is phi minus lambda times psi. At this stage, both phi and psi are completely and totally arbitrary vectors in my space. 
And to calculate the norm, I have to calculate the bra by taking the Hermitian conjugate. That means the lambda goes to lambda star when I do the bra. And then I just multiply it by the ket, and I have to FOIL that out. There are four terms. I'll get the bra ket of phi with itself. I'll get minus lambda, the bra phi with the ket psi. I'll get minus lambda star, the bra psi with the ket phi. And then I'll get modulus of lambda squared, the bra ket of psi. And because that's the square of a norm, it must be greater than or equal to zero. Now we simply do a rearrangement. We take those two negative terms, the cross terms, over to the other side, and we get that the uh, bracket phi plus lambda squared bracket psi is greater than or equal to lambda inner product of phi with psi plus lambda star inner product of psi with phi. And now we have a huge inspiration, and we pick a particular value for lambda. We're going to pick lambda to be inner product of psi with phi divided by the bracket psi. So I'm going to copy this on the next page. We're going to substitute that in, and we're going to get phi phi plus the norm of psi phi squared divided by psi psi. That's greater than or equal to psi phi norm squared divided by psi psi plus psi phi norm squared divided by psi psi. You can see that I have two terms that are the same on both sides. I can cancel them. And now I'm going to do a cross multiplication to get rid of the denominator on the right-hand side. And I'm going to switch the order. Eventually, I'm going to switch the order. So we get here that the product of the norm of the two vectors is bigger than or equal to the inner product squared between the two vectors. I'm going to put them on the other side and take the square root. And you see what we find here is the absolute value of the inner product between psi and phi is less than or equal to the length of phi multiplied by the length of psi. And that's, of course, the, no, the result that we expect to have. And that concludes the proof of the Schwartz inequality. So now we're going to move on to uncertainty. And we're going to work on this general derivation of the fluctuations with respect to the state chi. We're going to define these average values, the average of the operator x hat in state chi and the average of the operator p hat in state chi. We're going to represent them as these angle brackets with x and the angle brackets with p. That's just a notational thing to reduce the amount that we have to write down. And now if I add a constant inside a commutator, it obviously doesn't change anything because scalar numbers commute with everything. And so we actually learn that x minus the average of x commutator with p minus the average of p, that's the same as the commutator of x with p, and that's ih bar. That's our canonical commutation relation. If I now sandwich it with a bra ket chi, it's still equal to ih bar because chi is a normalized state. Now we're next going to define a state phi, which is this operator combination, x operator minus the average value of x multiplying chi. And psi is going to be the same thing, but with position instead of, I'm sorry, with momentum instead of position. So it's going to be p operator minus average value of p acting on chi. And now we're going to work with our identities that we had before. So we're, we're going to repeat now that ih bar is equal to uh, the chi sandwich of the, of the commutator, we're going to rewrite those commutator terms. There are two terms in that commutator, one that has the x to the left and the p to the right, and the other one that has it in the opposite order, p to the left and x to the right. It turns out I can write that in terms of the size and the chi's. It will be the overlap or inner product between phi and psi minus the overlap of psi with phi. Please look carefully at these definitions and make sure you understand that. Now, the next part of our equality simply rewrites the second term in terms of its complex conjugate. And now you see I have a number minus its complex conjugate. Well, if I have a number minus its complex conjugate, that's just twice the imaginary part of that number. So we learn ih bar is 2i times the imaginary part of this overlap of phi with psi. OK. But the overlap of phi with psi the imaginary part of that is less than the absolute value of that. So that's less than or equal to 2 times the absolute value of the inner product of phi with psi. And now we bring in the Schwartz inequality. That's less than or equal to 2 times the square root of the length of phi times the uh, length squared of phi times length squared of psi, or it's uh, 
um, less than or equal to 2 times the length of phi times the length of psi. All right, so that's summarizing everything that we know at this stage. Now, we also have that the fluctuations of position in the state chi is just given by chi expectation value of x minus the average value squared chi. And because x is Hermitian, we can write that as the overlap of phi with itself. And similarly, the fluctuations in p are the overlap of psi with itself. And so now we just substitute that into the inequality. We find that h bar is less than or equal to 2 times the delta of x in state chi times the delta of p in state chi. And then I can turn that around. I divide by 2, and I get delta of x in state chi multiplied by delta of p in state chi. That's greater than or equal to h bar over 2. This is the celebrated Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So let's summarize what we have done in this video. Okay, This restriction that we found between the products of these fluctuations came solely from the commutator and the Schwartz inequality. Nothing else went into it. It's rel related to a particular state chi, but other than that, the chi doesn't actually enter into the derivation. We needed no properties of the chi. We needed no properties of the Hamiltonian or anything like that. It just came from the commutator and the Schwartz inequality. All right, let's go with our full summary of this. This tells us that we cannot simultaneously know the position and the momentum in any quantum state because the product of those fluctuations is bigger than a non-zero number. Even more than this, it precisely limits how large those fluctuations each must be. If we are in a position eigenstate, the momentum fluctuations must go to infinity and vice versa. If I'm in a momentum eigenstate, the position fluctuations must go to infinity. Otherwise, I can't have it bigger than or equal to a non-zero number. Note that this is a property of the state. Note further, because students often confuse this, it does not say that if I measure position, I know something about what my measurement of momentum will be. That is not what uncertainty principle says. It says the fluctuations of the measurements of two different independent measurements but starting from the same state psi are related. So I have to do many, many measurements of position. I have to do many, many measurements of momentum. And then I find that the product of the uncertainties or the product of the fluctuations of each of those operators is larger than or equal to h bar over 2. Okay, And so I can determine that after I look at my uh, measurements. It tells us something about the state. It tells us something about the correlation of the fluctuations for two different measurements that are taken if I do the measurements starting from the same state, psi. Okay? So please don't confuse these two. All right, that is now the conclusion of Module 6, Lecture 2 on the Uncertainty Principle. I should end it simply with telling you that uh, this is one of the things that Heisenberg won his Nobel Prize for.